Um, my name is Robin Chattel. I'm a member of SEPA, uh, the Creative Independent Producers Alliance. And uh, thank you so much for coming to our panel uh, discussion, Producing the Future, Shifting Tides in New Work Development. Um, SEPA is a, a, we're a network. We're, we're an alliance of uh, creative and independent producers, um, US-based. Uh, we formed uh, during COVID, like most, uh, like many new alliances, to really, you know, support each other. And we have sort of three pillars that we that we work with, which is advocacy, uh, mentorship, and community. We advocate for the role of the creative and independent producer in the in the industry. Um, we uh, mentor young uh, and up and coming independent creative producers. Um, and uh, we also uh, create community, which is gather uh, others together, gather, gather like-minded individual uh, independent and creative producers together through um, public programs like this uh, session today. We, uh, uh, this is the beginning of um, our 2023 uh, sort of season of programming. You can become a member of the SEPA network uh, by going onto our website, sepausa.org. Um, we send out information and resources. Uh, we, we do all kinds of, you know, really want to help the field of independent and creative producers and try to, um, you know, make sure we're all uh, have the resources we need, um, you know, learning, mentoring, uh, and just community. Um, and um, I want to thank um, APAP um, for this incredible partnership in, in bringing us here today, um, and 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 real and and. Um, Acknowledging that there is there, that they, that we are a group that that we that we are important in the field of bringing new work to stages um, in all in all means, um, especially Krista Bradley for her help and Willie Santiago for his help. Um, I just want to uh, get right to our panel, introduce our moderator. Um, uh, this is a really exciting group of uh, of producers on stage and artists. Um, our moderator, Toria Beard, um, she's a New York-based uh, director, uh, creative consultant, a curator, choreographer, and producer. She specializes in dance and theater. She's been doing this work for over 25 years in all different ways. Um, and she's also um, the recipient of, uh, of uh, APAP's inaugural SEPA Award for Outstanding Achievement in Creative Producing uh, last year, 2022. And she was also featured along with uh, Idel Cassell and Idina uh, Menzel in Variety and Lifetime's Power of the Women. Um, so um, everyone, uh, thank you again for coming. Um, I just want to remind you um, to please fill out the APAP survey on your way out. Uh, there's a barcode on the door. And um, thank you so much. And Toria, um, enjoy. And thank, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all. Um, and I know we are coming from, I don't know, dragging ourselves out of the bed. <laughs> so I was hoping we could just take a second, you know, just take a minute and, and maybe like um, let yourself calm down and, and uh, become available for this exchange we're going to have. So if, if you feel comfortable doing so and you can close your eyes or lower your gaze on the down diagonal, let's just take a, a, a couple seconds just to settle. Beautiful, thank you so much, thank you. Um, so yeah, we're gonna have a beautiful conversation here and I'm gonna ask uh, for these incredible panelists. First of all, thank you all so much. I'm so thrilled to be here with you and to be able to meet with you and see you in person. Um, but I'm hoping you will introduce yourselves to our new friends here. Hi everyone, I'm Shanta Thaik. Uh, I'm the Chief Artistic Officer at Lincoln Center here in New York City. I'm also a co-director of Global Fest tonight in New York City at Lincoln Center. So, uh, and I was the co-chair of APAP in 2019 and 2020, so I am beyond thrilled to be back at APAP and with all of you uh, in person. Hi everyone, I'm Courtney Ozaki. Um, I am an independent creative producer of experiential um, theater and um, multidisciplinary, and I also am the uh, co-founder of an organization called the Japanese Arts Network, which is an organization I created to uh, lift up and support Japanese artists in America. And I'm also um, fortunate to be on the SIPA organizing committee and um, was a SIPA fellow this year. 
I'm Skip Sherry. I'm a composer, and uh, I create with my artistic partner and wife, Coco Carroll, these large-scale immersive choral events. I'm a, probably a consummate uh, avant-garde New York artist in a lot of ways, <laughs> uh, meaning I, I compose music f for film. I do. I work. I do. I, I internationally, I work with contemporary circus, and in New York City, I do all kinds of jobs and have to self-produce often, because that's what you have to do in New York. Thank you. So um, the part of the title of this panel is Shifting Tides in New Work Development. So um, do you think that we're talking about uh, moving forward, sort of like post-pandemic in this new world, not going backwards, but going forward, um, do you think the experience, um, your experience during the pandemic um, in shutdown, isolation, reemergence, and whatever this mutating world is we're living in right now, do you think um, that has changed anything about how we approach our work? Um, and I'm gonna ask uh, Courtney, if you would start, since your work, um, you are a connector, you are bringing people together, um, independently, maybe you can talk, start, and then anybody else can answer. Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I definitely think that, um, well, first of all, I think it's uh, changed the way that we're able to work across uh, the country. For me personally, um, we're able to collaborate and reach broader audiences um, with our um, conversation and dialogue, but then I think coming back from the pandemic, there was a craving for um, for human connection and also a craving for feeling things. Um, so as an immersive creator, um, I recognized that um, people were more ready to, um, to be in space together and to receive. Um, we also were talking earlier about just kind of like the understanding of um, people wanting to um, to recognize that the the pain and not just you know try to side swipe sidestep the fact that um, we've all been through this um, together and apart and so people are more um, ready to participate um, so I think that that that's something that I've noticed um, we've also uh, I created a, an immersive piece that was uh, to be done uh, via driving experience um, during the pandemic. And um, for me as a creator, that really um, evolved into storytelling um, for like how did people, how did people engage with that and then how can that um, transform into being in space together um, and sharing these important um, historical stories that people are kind of having this um, inner reflection um, with their own um, biases, I think, um, because that really, you know, that came out of a lot of other things that happened in our society at that time, you know, um, the killing of George Floyd, and um, trying to understand how do we um, not just be performative as creators, but also um, really seek that inner reflection and try to understand um, what can we create um, as artists that allows people to um, reflect inward first and then um, I think coming out of the pandemic, people were ready to, to talk about that, but um, maybe in, access it in different ways, if that makes sense. Yes, it does, thank you. Um, yes, do. I guess I'm thinking about when COVID first hit, how every artist I knew just to feel sane was desperately trying to figure out how Zoom worked <laughs> and realizing that it sucked. Like it was, not, especially for music, it was not made for this. It had all the, the filters that goes, this is noise. You couldn't give a drum lesson over Zoom. You know, it wasn't designed for this medium. And also the internet in the US sucks. It's like you know, driving a Ferrari on an old country road. Like it's, a, it's not a good infrastructure. However, however, I did get a call from uh, Rachel Rose Reed, who's this really amazing storyteller in the UK, saying, hey, I'm doing the storytelling series. Will you collaborate with Debs Newbold, who I hadn't met, another great uh, storyteller in the UK, and she's in this beautiful town, someplace on the English countryside, and I was in New Hampshire next to a lake, and she did the story of Orpheus, and from where I was at, because it didn't have to be in sync, I could 
do all the sound design for her storytelling. And that was an amazing experience through this crappy technology. So pushing through that and making it work anyway, like I can't go back now. I'm expecting to, and I, I'm expecting to participate and collaborate with my international friends now in a way that I could have before, but since I wasn't forced to do it, I didn't. So I think that's a big change. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, to, I mean, I think to build on, on both of those things in terms of how we at Lincoln Center really, I think, changed uh, our focus is that we really did shift a lot to our audience and our community and really because through the pandemic we had turned over a lot of our spaces to be blood drive and food bank and voting centers, uh, really understanding that our role in the city had shifted necessarily and and we wanted to not lose that but actually recognize that the folks that were coming to any number of those things are our audience, whether they thought of themselves as our audience or not. So, so really creating multiple spaces and I think creating a different kind of respect for our audiences and, and a, a decentering ourselves because, you know, we are the elephant in every room. <laughs> so, so I think uh, trying to take our, our own story out of it and, and really placing either the artist or the audience in the center of how we move. Uh, and so for us, that really looks like changing a lot of things, but um, really shifting ticketing models, doing choose what you pay ticketing for all of our events, at least to some degree, doing all of our outdoor events free. Um, and then actually, I think to Courtney's point, really um, moving a lot of our work to uh, incentivize participation and recognize that the audience was there. I think we spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time in my previous programming really creating the work for the stage and, and kind of surprisingly to myself, not thinking about the audience at all. <laughs> Just assuming they'll come and of course they're gonna have a great time and like, great, well, you know, we'll see you next time. Um, but really thinking about how do we actually thank every single person that has come in? How do we recognize them as a person that we want to actually be in relationship with? And, and I think so that, and, and also not cause harm to. So um, really thinking about all the ways, all the different barriers we have that we put up and how do we sort of slowly take them down um, along the, the process of, of bringing somebody into the space. I have a follow-up question, perhaps, for this, which is, um, for, for it's gonna look different for each person, for each environment, right? For institutions versus independent artists. However, maybe some people um, were not working as much as you all were in, you know, in the height of the pandemic. So coming out of it, this, sound, this all sounds so beautiful. How, can we take the steps to make the space to continue working like this for people who maybe haven't done it but want to or are thinking about it for, their, for themselves? Well, I think, um, you know, I'm not connected to an institution, um, but I think coming out of the pandemic, I, was, I, was re I had a really busy year. Um, but it's mostly because institutions were um, really seeking to connect with community. So, um, you know, I think uh, people who want to be doing this work um, identify um, where are there people that have resources that are now trying to reach community in really intentional ways. And then how are, what are the, you know, what is the art or what are the programs or who are the artists that you can work with in order to um, really intentionally think about um, the needs of, of people in that community. Um, so for example, I, um, I did a, with the Japanese Arts Network um, History Colorado Center in Denver. I'm based in Denver. I don't know if I said that earlier. Um, I'm not based in New York City. Um, <laughs> but in any case, um, they approached me and they said, you know, we have this um, exhibit uh, space that we are hoping to bring in the Asian community 
um, the AAPI and H community, um, you know, and they, of course, they approached me at a time um, of, con like, from a, t a space of great care, you know, and concern for the Asian community with the rise of anti-Asian hate crimes. Um, and, you know, this is near the time of Atlanta as well. And I've worked with them in the past, but um, they were like, how can we, um, you know, what can we do? And so um, I thought about, well, what is really important to the Asian community in, in Colorado and, I, and food? Um, and so, um, you know, I think, I thought about the, the Asian diaspora in Colorado and how um, much it's contributed to our community there, um, whether it's from business or, um, you know, in creating spaces for people or um, also like the economy and um, creating the food that we, we eat there. Um, and so I worked with a lot of different artists to then, um, with the resources that this institution was giving me, um, to then pay them to um, create reflections on, um, you know, storytelling mechanisms for what their experience was with food in Colorado. Um, and then I also approached them and said, you know, I think we need to have this gathering event. Um, we can't just have this exhibit, we need to bring people into the space. So we need to do a night market because that's something that's kind of a through line between a lot of Asian cultures. Um, and it, we need to invite in community groups to have tables to talk about the work that they're doing um, and to share with people. We need to have food that people eat together and we need to have also a performance space where people can um, express themselves in ways that are not just, um, you know, something that you can, prescriptive or something you can read on a wall. You know, I think people take in information in so many different ways and so we need to have, you know, all of these, all of these mechanisms. And then we also need a, a mechanism for people to um, be able to provide their own feedback and reflection. So, um, you know, so bringing even more community partners to support financially um, and also to reach more people to talk about like that anti-Asian hate um, discussion, but from the perspective of like lunchbox moments. So, you know, um, people having moments where they felt othered by the food that they eat and being able to share it whether they wanted to, you know, personally or anonymously. Um, I would say in terms of the long term, like Courtney's example, I think reaching out to your local artist community and understanding that our artists really are the center of their own community and are trusted uh, in their community in a way that you probably never will be. Um, and so I think that I think is a, is a critical piece of, of continuing success. And then I think we have also um, in that sort of decentering idea really leaned on partnerships. Uh, and I think like the creation of SEPA, so many new partnerships formed in the time of the pandemic, but really holding on to those and understanding, I see Duke Dang here from Works in Process, the, you know, Duke knows more about the creation of new dance works and street dance styles than I will ever know, even if I spent the next, you know, six months of my life just like digging in and reading every book. He's done the work, he's trusted in that community, and so to bring in that organization and do programming and, and be, have the trust in these partners to be able to get out of the way and not try to put this very heavy curatorial hand on top of everything, um, but really let the, the partnerships go and understand that some of those things are gonna work, some of those are not gonna work. Um, but really, if the relationship is strong, you're gonna have an audience that comes in that will never come by virtue of your e-blast. So I think being able to really um, step out of, out of the way of these relationships and, and, and then continue them. You know, it's the, not having these sort of helicopter relationships, but really long-term. And what we try to say now is, you know, any partnership we enter, we enter with the intention of holding on to that partnership, you know, for all time. Sometimes it doesn't work that way, but the but the intentionality should be by starting this conversation and saying yes to whatever the first project is. We're really saying yes to a long-term relationship and being in this conversation, not having one conversation and then, you know, we'll see you four years from now when you may happen to come back to one show again. So I think that that has been a real shift for me personally and I think for the institution overall um, of just 
being a little bit more humble in the way that you know, we think of our, our great curation, <laughs> curation uh, and, and being able to understand that that's actually not what's bringing people back to the institution. Thank you. I feel like that's a beautiful roadmap. Yeah, I don't yeah. have much else to say, but I'm, I'm just thinking about having toured a lot of my adult life. It's always one crazy fucker that makes a scene. There's this great little club. There's this l great little um, free jazz venue. And it's the guy's name. I can't remember his name. He's, he's German. He takes you swimming. You all swim naked. He's like, this is how we do it in Germany. <laughs> and uh, he, his audience, which is a small town audience, 100 people come out to see free jazz because he is so intense about it. And they're a community, and they get to hang out. They get to have beers and stuff like that. I'm like, how did you create a free jazz scene in this tiny little German town. And then he liked my old band, which was a Gypsy Tango Klesmer punk band, so he put us on stage. But it's always someone like him. It's always just one person building community, and that's it. And, and I, the other thing, as I always say, is every artist, and I'm thinking musicians especially, because they're always complaining, this, guy's, this person's paying them, this person isn't, is you produce a show. So you know what's at stake, and you know what, how you lose money at producing. You know, so, and then if you do that well, you build a scene around it, and as you're talking, it's, it's all, you know, this big internet thing, we still all live in villages of a hundred people, and most of those people we met in person. So, yeah. Thank you all for that. Um, and it does feel like maybe, because I've been thinking about this a lot too, the idea of curation, institutional curation specifically, and what you're, explaining is that you curated a group of leaders and maybe and that and you then you let it go you know you let it live you let it breathe which is fantastic and i've been thinking a lot and i love everything you all have said thank you so much for that about how can we build a bridge from like where we were <laughs> to where we want to be and i feel like this is how you know the long term commitment real relationships um, and that the passion for what it is you're doing and building Well, it's community. also interesting what Shant is saying because with this choral stuff we do, we use the libretto is, comes from interviews with the community and it is always a question with me, how much can I get out of the way? Like how, how can I in, involve the community in this thing and then basically I make, I'm like I've, I've invented a guitar and say, now you can play it. So it's an, always a question for me and especially as a white person stepping into situations where the, the choir singers in the community isn't necessarily white, like how can I get out of the way, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. um, all right, so. Oh, so now I want to ask uh, about maybe something, perhaps we've touched on it, but maybe not, like something that surprised you or something that clicked for you that set something different in motion with, with your work, with your collaborators, with, I don't know, the way you think about it. I mean, I think there's an enormous amount that was surprising and I, I <laughs> but the, um, one of the things that was surprising again for me personally was this idea, um, of how much I had thought of myself in the ecosystem as a presenter, as a curator, but really I spend, you know, the majority of my time as an audience member. Mm -hmm. And then thinking about that experience and how many rules there are of participation and, and how I know all of them, and that's partially why I think I enjoy going, because it's a place that I feel like I have a sense of what's gonna happen, I understand the rules, and, and then coming back after the pandemic and, and um, or not after, but you know, um, seeing shows, and I'm sure you're all having this kind of same out of body experience of being at APAP if you've been to APAP before where it's like, it's the same, but it's not the same, <laughs> but it's, you know, there's so many things that you're like, oh my God, their booth is in the same place, but, but we've had a pandemic. <laughs> I don't know, there's like some missing thing of just, you know, in your mind. And so going back to shows 
And for me, sitting in an audience, and usually like the first show back of the opera or the, your favorite theater company, there would be this big to do. And you know, everybody, thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh, we can't believe it. We've done this. We're all here together. And then you go to like the second show and nothing, like not a single mention. And everybody, you know, I think there's this assumption as a presenter, as an arts worker, that everybody is seeing as many shows as you are. And that's just most people in the room. There are people going to a show tonight that that will be the first show they've seen in four years. And I think just understanding what people give up to be in a show and, and to be there in person, I think is something that's worth uh, recognizing in whatever way that, that looks like. And so uh, at Lincoln Center this summer, we did this thing that I was just telling these guys about the, um, where we created this ritual uh, before every single show. So before every show this summer, we had hundreds of free shows. Uh, and whether they were in our like speakeasy underground or in the big Damrosh Park show, we would do this three-line poem that Mahogany Brown wrote. And it was a call and response. It had ASL connected to it so that people could, could do this ritual with us and also kind of be in their bodies and just feel like they were... One, you know, it, it recognized kind of this moment, but it also, I think, recognized that like we see you, <laughs> we see you out there, we know you're here, we we want to hear your actual voice, and we can't really do this without you. Um, so I think that's for me, and I don't, I'm not now. I'm like, I'm not sure what we're doing this summer because, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll figure it out by the time we get there. <laughs> but the uh, but there is, I think, um, for me, that was the biggest. Uh, aha moment of just of being just so grateful for every individual in the space and recognizing that um, that they're bringing so much with them and more so now than ever before of what it actually means to be sitting next to somebody and we have to I think our role is really to make the case for live performance because it's now one of the only times people are getting out of their apartments or their you know it's it's just such a the, I think the urgency is just so much greater. Uh, and I think we have to just step into that urgency every chance we get. Yeah, I think um, you, you brought up ritual. And um, I think um, something's not surprising to me, but I guess something that I just acknowledge is um, just how much gratitude we all have, but also um, the the concept of care, you know, um, care for ourselves, care for others. Um, <laughs> when I when I was able to, had the opportunity to do the SEPA fellowship, and I was writing out kind of like what is my plan for this funding because we did receive funding, which I had extremely deep gratitude for because as you were saying, like how do we do this work, right? And um, we have to, in, as creative producers, we have to have overhead in order to be able to do the work. Um, and I think that's what, that was the impetus for SIPA. And it, in a sense, is just like, um, don't forget about us. We are here and we're, we're vital, you know, um, but we also need, have livelihoods and our people. Um, but I think like as a producer, I've, I've definitely thought about care in a lot of different ways. And the funding from the fellowship, I um, intentionally like allocated some of that for mental health, um, and like just like thinking like giving myself permission to do that was a really hard thing to do, but um, it was I recognized that that was something that I needed at the time in order to continue to do my work, um, and then also thinking about care for the audience. And so when we did this immersive show, um, you know, I just really thinking about you're taking them um, through these, you're asking them to access these places and parts of themselves that are, um, you know, that are really raw. And so how do we create a space of care for them um, as you take them on this journey and then as they leave as well? Um, and I went to um, the Indigo Room last night and I was just so, um, I, I felt like very cared for afterward, and we were given this sort of token 
um, when we left, and it was just, um, it was, I encourage you to go see that, by the way, if you're, if you're able to, but yeah, I think care is something that I've really thought a lot more about than I used to. Uh, yeah. I think what surprised me during the pandemic, I was, I was thinking when I was asked to do this panel, what performances during the pandemic worked? And there were two of them that really worked for me, where I was like, like a live, because I love live art, right? People in front, live art. And one was uh, Toshi Regan's, uh, the presentation of Toshi Regan's uh, Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower by uh, Bill Bragan at NYU, NYU Abu Dhabi. So this is a performance that wasn't live. It happened a year beforehand. But Bill hyped everyone up, and people commented during it, and it felt live. You know, and it, was a, it wasn't a close-up camera angle. It was like you were up in the balcony. And I had to think, why did that work? We were in New Hampshire. First of all, it was relief, because it was so beautiful. It was such beautiful music, so beautifully presented. So it was a gr great performance, but why did it feel live? And I think partially because we were all commenting, this is awesome, during, this is fantastic, you know, which you can't do in a lot of performances, actually. So that removal of everyone being in their private personal space and having a way to communicate, we're like, oh, did you, uh, is that, you know? And then the other one was every Monday night through the pandemic, the Bindlestiff Family Circus, which is a long-going independent institution in New York, had the Bindlestiff Family Circus open stage, and there were board circus artists all over the world, some at, uh, like, Mexico City, like, shaky, bad Zoom, you know, you're, you're rooting for them, and you're rooting for Zoom, and, and, and <laughs> they had a contest. If you commented the most, they would physically send you a sash. For, uh, I got it once. Uh, so those two performances, because they were like, yeah, talk during the performance. They really worked, and they let you have fun. And it was such, both those things, we did it every Monday night. Those are the two, th those are the two best live performances, and one of them wasn't live. So I'm still thinking about that. I mean, honestly, sometimes I miss the intimacy of doing so much on Zoom, like yeah. really having that focus, you know? Right. Um, and I wonder if you all feel like we can make space for all of these things now to exist, not, not as a Band-Aid or not for a, a moment, but to help them move us forward, you know, all of the things we've discovered and the new ways of working across, I don't know, different countries and time, time zones and all of that stuff. Like, what do you all, do you think there, this will help move us forward or move us in the direction that is progressive, you know, I'll tell you something that I think. It's, it's all the attitude of the curator. Because I, you know, I'm like any other artist, like my pre-pandemic relationship with curators, half the time was, we have this box to fill, and how long is your thing? Okay, when's sound check? And that was it. Now, I'm having conversations with the curator, and I'm finding out why they're having me, or, you know, and how does it fit into their program? Like, I don't know if it's me, but I have a feeling well, there's less performances. They're just, there's the, it's a different relationship, I feel, with me and the curators. Like, it's, it's, a converse, it's much more of a conversation. And it's not just about all the technical bits and whether we, got, we filled in this, this time in the box, for them or me, you know? So I think if the curator makes it fun, then this ridiculous little postage stamp side of the milk carton thing can be fun, you know? So I forgot to mention earlier, I'm, um, I'm actually on the board of the Western Arts Alliance. And something that was really um, beautiful to me in this last Western Arts Alliance conference was um, sort of turning things on their head and dishing the pitch. Um, so it started these, um, and, and then we had this session afterward um, that we always have 
called What's Next? Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, I think the thing that just kept coming up over and over again was this sort of appreciation for having these really honest conversations between presenters and agents or presenters and artists. Um, and not, and like where artists are asking presenters what, what they need and um, presenters are asking artists what they need and having like these really honest conversations with one another. About money too. Yeah, yeah. money, um, things that are normally danced around or hard or, or sometimes straightforward, but um, you know, I think is less transactional. And I think that's, some, that's like something. Like you're both trying to accomplish something together. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, well, now I'm thinking about, <laughs> we talked a little bit about um, expectations, I suppose, like our expectation or your expectation as a producer or a presenter for the audience. And also, do you, I guess the question is, do you think um, your expectations have changed at all as far as how you want people to show up. I think the idea of um, responding in real time in Zoom and like having a ball in the chat is amazing, but how does that translate to, is there space for that to happen, say, in a, in a, a live uh, situation? And if so, um, what could that look like? Is it even something that we want? Like the dividing line, you know, is there an interest in blurring that line, I guess is my question. I think yes, I think, and I, I feel like most of the work I've seen in this last week has been exactly that. You know, if, I think there's a, there's a huge, I think there has been an uplift of the artists that have always been working in this way and have this more immersive, um, work and ritualistic work and way that respected their audience in a different way perhaps or they knew their audience. I also think artists in the same way through Zoom and through, they had a lot more FaceTime with their fans um, and, and a lot more sort of one-on-one -on -one and a sort of, and, a, and also with the, the sort of presenter out of the equation um, for a lot of artists really were able to have these very different kind of conversations with their fans about, I can't make rents, I don't have health insurance. Um, and so I think artists, at least that I've seen, are, are responding to that too. You know, you can watch them see an audience and, and know, like, whereas before they were more perhaps a symbol of their community or connected, you know, more spiritually to their community now, you know, you, they, it's like I know <laughs> you and you and you, and um, and so I do think the work is reflective of that. There's there's much more of a um, we've sort of taken down some of those facades that were there before, or that that you know, oh, we want our artists to be over there, and to be this kind of ideal of of what of seeing myself on stage. And I think uh, some of that has kind of necessarily gone away. Um, I think there's still a place for it, but I, I just, I see so much of the work. I mean, I saw Sonny Jane last night uh, in Joe's Pub, and he literally probably said hi to every single person during the show. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, hey, there's Rubina. Oh, hi, is that Janet back there? <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um, and so it was a really, you know, that was, and it was a story, more of a storytelling show, but I was like, wow, this is, I've never seen him do that, and I've seen this band, you know, perform hundreds of times probably. Um, so it was, I do think some of that is just like the natural what's happening with art, how artists are thinking and how they want to, they've opened up, you know, for better or for worse, have been very vulnerable in this time. And so I think some of that is just being reflected in the kind of work that's being seen. Um, something else that I've noticed a lot over the past couple of years are like a lot of co-productions, a lot of collaborative or um, communal fundraising efforts, and I guess moving the conversation more to the community of producers and cultural leaders. Um, what do you think, or you, how do you hope 
things will develop with those relationships. Yeah, I think, um, so I, this show that I just produced this winter um, was a Japanese supernatural folktale. Um, so it was very, uh, I, the way that we funded it was, um, I think it was, so we, it, we co-produced it for it first and foremost. So there were four primary producers that came together to produce this, um, understanding that we had different access to different resources. Um, but then we also understood with having four producers and having um, this really strong um, investment from the artists, because we were asking a lot of them um, to be doing these performances as six artists, um, I'm sorry, my phone just fell. Um, <laughs> um, we were asking them to do six, perf um, six artists to do four performances a day on a 45 minute rotation, uh, four, three days a week and one day a week, five performances a day, which is a lot. Um, you know, and it's also, we asked them to help us devise this work though, um, so that they could create this, um, these roles in a way that they felt like it was of themselves as well, because they were gonna have to be in this. But I think um, as far as how we funded it, we, um, because we knew that we needed to value everybody and people needed to, maybe they haven't had work in a long time, um, they needed to pay their health insurance, they needed to cover all these things. Um, we approached these different community organizations that we knew um, would this type of work would resonate with, but also that they were looking to share about their cultural community, about the Japanese history in Denver and the history of incarceration. And, um, but I think, um, as I think about it now, I think we could even be approaching more, um, I spoke on this panel for the Colorado Health Foundation um, during the summer, and um, you know, a lot of the same things we talk about here at APAP, um, are, um, or in these conversations are things that they're talking about there as well. Um, so just recognizing that in social health, for example, um, they're trying to reach people in the same ways um, and they're trying to find what is the conduit for that and I think the answer is art, storytelling, this authentic sort of um, bringing of yourself, uh, this vulnerability. Um, so I think, um, I kind of forgot the question, but I think basically, you know, finding that support from within community partners in that way um, is really critical, but also like helping them to see that um, the impact and the vitality of, um, you know, on a really personal level. Like I've, I um, am trying to work on sort of strategically about how to pull together everything that all the feedback I've received from the show because it, we sold tickets also out of word of mouth because we didn't have a lot of press. Um, but I think people saw something in the show that they wanted to share with others in a time that they're, everybody's sort of still in this healing space, right? Um, and so I think, um, yeah, trying to recognize that it's something that people want to support, but maybe they don't, under, they don't know that it's accessible to them to support it, you know? I mean, the only, I think in terms of these partnerships and, and what is long-term, and I think the reality is, well, I really do believe that the work that we're doing is the most urgent thing that everyone needs more than they have ever needed it in like the history that we have all shared, that we have lived through. So one, I think it's the most urgent, and two, I know this is a shock to all of you, but everybody has a lot less money. <laughs> So <laughs> there's like both of those realities um, mean that if you really believe this is the most important thing that can and should be happening, you have to do it in partnership. Whether you are an individual producer or you're Lincoln Center, and that means you just you have to be reaching out all the time and figuring out who is my network, who is you know. I think I'm spending a lot of time in this week thinking about okay, who are my partners across the fields in terms of building work and because we're, you know, we're shifting the way we're working. And 
So figuring out who those people are is, is just critical because we can't do less, you know? I mean, we can, we can, we can, and I'm sure some of us are, but we, the work that we do has to be really deep, it has to be very meaningful, and it has to be, it just has to be necessarily in partnership. So I think um, we're just all gonna, we're all gonna get real cozy over the next little bit. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I think it's like what you were saying before about decentering, right? So if we decenter our indiv ourselves as individuals and center our communities or the groups and our partners, I think we will be able to accomplish a lot. Um, this has been um, very uplifting for me. Thank you all so much. We have about um, five minutes, but I was hoping that you would each just... Um, put your wish out or send something out to um, the folks in the space that maybe can plant a seed or that we can take away um, with us when we move into this future in five, <laughs> five minutes <laughs> uh, about working together, working, whatever it is, whatever reflection or whatever, Jim, you want to share. Well, this is probably more of an age thing, but now I realize more and more, and I realized it before, but I realized it more, that every part of the process of doing art, you've arrived. And that is, oh, I'm going to get a cup of coffee, and before I perform, that's a beautiful moment. You know, or I'm wiping sweat off my brow, that's a beautiful moment, and just, that's what the pandemic really did. I'm like, oh, I miss the entire process. Like, ah, oh, shit, I have to get up and go to this conference, and my kid's jumping on me. You know, it's awesome. You know, so, and, and with that com comes appreciation for everyone around you and everyone you're working with, you know, including the security guards and the curator and everybody. So that's, that's, I, that's, that's come more home to me than ever before. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, to echo what you said, um, I think just like a deep gratitude for the interdependence of everything that um, is required to make these things happen. And then also, um, you know, I just thinking about, um, it sounds kind of frou-frou, but just thinking about what kind of ancestors we want to be and how are we um, putting things forward for future generations and, uh, but also living in the present, right? So. Um, it's just um, constantly being cognizant of the interdependence of all of these layers um, that allow us to do work. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I'm really just going to stay on that ancestor moment. Um, I'm going to, I think, I don't have any closing words. I'm going to make you guys do the ritual with me. Do you guys want to do a ritual? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to use my hands. Hold on. Okay, you repeat after me. Remember. Remember. The people we love and lost. The people we love and lost. Reclaim. Reclaim. Tomorrow with hands full of hope. Tomorrow with hands full of hope. Rejoice. Rejoice. Our hearts are full. Our hearts are full. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there's nothing, nothing more to be said. Thank you all so much. Um, it's been a pleasure, and I'm supposed to remind you all to please complete your survey. I think there are QR codes for you to scan and maybe some other cards somewhere. Um, thank you all so much. It's been wonderful to be here with you this morning. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and have a beautiful life. Thank you all. Thank you.